All right, so the first lesson uh, for today is quantum model. So we talked about Bohr model yesterday. Uh, we studied atomic history leading up to the Bohr model. And then um, I mentioned that today we're going to basically refute the Bohr model and study the most recent atomic theory, uh, which is the quantum model. So before we can do that, we have to learn something about quantum mechanics, uh, just the, the bare minimum basics. And we'll talk about orbitals, uh, which is vitally important, and quantum numbers that describes electrons in those orbitals. Okay, so first things first, um, something about quantum theory. So Louis de Broglie, um, he was a French physicist. He was the one that proposed that not only did um, light have particle wave duality, but also electrons, okay? And not just electrons, all matter in the universe can exhibit wave particle duality. Meaning that everything on the macroscopic scale and the microscopic all have a wavelength. And that equation, lambda equals H over P. Lambda is the wavelength, H is Planck's constant, and P is the momentum of any particle. So this is basically saying that Anything can have a wavelength as long as you have a momentum, okay? And they're inversely proportional. So if you have high wavelength, that means you have low momentum and vice versa. So macroscopic objects like your bodies, we have relatively large masses. So your wavelength is ridiculously small. And so we just don't say you have a wavelength. So we're not concerned about your wavelength. But an electron is really tiny. It has a small mass. So as a result, its wavelength is relatively larger. So we must consider that the electron being a wave, not just a particle, just like light. So it's a particle and a wave. So our conventional way of viewing electrons as individual particles in a specific location is actually incorrect. So the quantum model views electrons as waves and we view them as probabilities instead of finding them in particular locations. So Erwin Schrodinger, we kind of mentioned him yesterday as well. He was a physicist. Um, he basically came up with an equation to calculate where you can find electrons. So he proposed that since electrons are waves, right? So these waves are at a particular distance from the nucleus and they are standing waves of whole number wavelengths. A standing wave is simply a wave that is closed on two ends and it oscillates in the middle. So imagine a guitar string. If you pluck a guitar string, it will start to vibrate and it is closed on its two ends. So standing waves are basically what electrons are. So an electron, is essentially a wave that loops around at a certain distance and it has a integer number of wavelengths. So n equals to one, two, three, four, five, six. It can't be a fraction or a decimal because if it is, the wave wouldn't close, okay? If the wave doesn't close, it will exhibit destructive interference and cancel each other out. So you can't have that. So any other orbits, of the electron, they are not allowed because if they were allowed, then the wave would collapse undergoing destructive interference. So the picture below is the only possibility, well, the only possibilities of finding electrons and how they can exist in an atom. Okay, so orbits do not exist. If anything, orbits that's where you can most likely find an electron, not for sure. All right, so where is it though? You have a whole wave, but where is the electron exactly? See, that question is difficult to answer because electrons are not particles. You can't just pinpoint and say, hey, it's right there. So Schrodinger came up with this wave function. Uh, don't be intimidated. You don't have to use this equation. You don't have to understand what this means. This wave function describes the probability of finding an electron around the nucleus. Okay, the key word here is probability. We don't know for certain where the electron is, but we can kind of guess and we can have an idea where that electron is. Okay, you see what I'm saying? 
So using the wave function, the solutions to this wave function indicate the region where you can have the highest probability of finding electrons. And you can graph this, you can have a probability curve, a probability distribution. And this will tell you where to look for that electron. So for example, if your parents want to know where you are right now, um, the best bet is to look in your home. That is the, pro the highest probability of finding you right now. They're not gonna go to the mall to look for you because like, I don't think the malls are open right now. So you could still be in the mall. You could technically have broken in, but that is not a likely scenario. So the most probable answer is you're at home. Same thing here, electrons can be found in certain regions with high probability. So what I just described was the definition of an orbital. Okay, so an orbital is the region around the nucleus where you have the highest probability of finding an electron. By highest, I mean 90% or greater. So orbital is a region in space. We represent electrons using electron clouds in the picture around a nucleus, okay? Those dots that you see, they're not electrons. It doesn't literally mean they have that many electrons, no. It simply means in that grayed out dotted region, you have a 90% chance of finding that electron. Okay, meaning that outside of that blob, you have a 10% chance of finding the electron, so a much lower probability. And you can, of course, graph the probability of finding an electron as a function of the radius of, of, the, of the distance from the nucleus, not the radius. And if you look at that curve, um, that dashed vertical line, that marks the highest probability of finding an electron. And if you look at that distance, it just so happens to be the radius of the first orbit. Okay, at that magical distance from the nucleus, you have the highest probability of finding your electron and it coincides with Bohr's prediction of where an orbit should be. So orbits don't exist. Bohr was wrong about that. But the merit to Bohr diagram is that those imagined orbits are actually regions where you're most likely to find the electron. So this means that you can find electrons outside of that orbit. It's just you have a lower probability. And if you look on the graph at the origin, where the distance to the nucleus is zero, then the probability of finding an electron drops to zero. Okay, you don't find electrons in the nucleus. But if you look to the right, the graph kind of tails off. It approaches the x-axis, all right? This is an asymptote. It never actually reaches zero. The probability of finding an electron is always non-zero as you move away from the nucleus. You just think about that for a second. What does this entail? That means you can find electrons basically anywhere. So imagine one atom in your face right now, and that atom has electrons. Where do you find those electrons? Well, it's probably around the nucleus. So, well, 90% chance, right? But if you move away from that atom, so you move away from your face, you can still have a non-zero probability of finding that electron you could have that electron on the moon right now. It's just, it's really unlikely, but that probability is not zero. So if you have infinite numbers of universes, there's gotta be at least one universe where you, know, you have your electron on the moon. Okay, it's rare, but it doesn't mean it won't happen. And also an orbital can contain a maximum of two electrons, no more than that. All right, so that cloud, you can have a maximum of two. Once you know that there's two electrons in there, there's not going to be a third one. So do we have any questions regarding what an orbital is before we move on? This is really vital information. You've got to know what an orbital is. So questions, please. Yeah, so if you have more than two electrons, is there going to be more of orbital? Exactly. So if you have more than two, well, you're going to need more orbitals. Okay, so there is more than one orbital in an atom and we'll learn about the different types of orbitals very shortly. So do we have any other questions? All right, cool. So you guys are all good with the fact that electrons are waves and you can't pinpoint where they are and you can only describe the probabilities of finding an electron. All right, so this brings us to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. 
This simply says you can't know both the positions and the velocity in, or momentum of an electron at any given time. You can only know one but not the other, okay? The equation right there, you don't have to be concerned with it. Um, uh, let me just explain what that equation means for a sec. Delta X means your, your possibilities of position, where you can be. Delta P is your possibilities of momentum, okay? Momentum is velocity times mass, where you're going. So the product of those two is greater or equal to a constant on the right side. Meaning that if you know more about the position, then you must know less about the product because it's an inequality. And likewise, if you know less about the position, you will know more about the momentum, okay? So the more you know about one, the less you know about the other. And this has nothing to do with you know, our inability to measure. It doesn't mean we suck at measuring. It's, this is a fundamental law of physics. It's built into the fabric of the universe. That's just a property. The more you know about the momentum, the less you know about the position and vice versa. That is Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So if you want to talk about finding an electron, we can only ever talk about the probability of finding an electron, not exactly where it is. So if you look at the diagrams on the bottom, figure A, you have an electron in a box. This is classical physics. That is the, contempor uh, that is, that is the uh, classical view of an electron. It is just a particle you can find in a specific place. So you can say, oh, look, the electron's right there. Okay, that's it. But that is not how electrons behave, so we can't actually use that one. So if you look at B, this is a more accurate model. Electrons are waves. So electrons are standing waves. They have two ends that are closed, and it oscillates, okay? So if you look at the state one on the bottom, that is what your electron is probably gonna look like as a wave. So where would you find that? Figure C will tell you. In the middle, you will have the highest probability of finding that electron. And at the two ends called nodes, you have a zero probability of finding those electrons. So it is a probability distribution. Your electron doesn't have to be in state one. It can have two peaks instead of one peak. So if you're state two, the probability curve looks different. You have two peaks, so you have two really high probabilities of finding an electron in those places. And in the middle, you have exactly zero probability. Again, that's a node, All right? Does that make sense? Instead of having a specific location, you have probabilities of finding electrons. You can't be certain where an electron is. If you absolutely pinpoint where an electron is, that means you have no idea where it is going because of the un uncertainty principle. And if you have absolute All right, so that was a video summary of what we learned so far about the wave nature of electrons and uh, their probabilities and the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So let's move on to representing these electrons on paper. So recall from previous class that there are different energy levels, okay? They were discovered by Bohr and electrons can be found in these energy levels. So Bohr, imagine, orbits around the nucleus, like the picture on the left. Now we know that that is incorrect. So how would we represent electrons then? Well, the picture on the right is the quantum model of how we represent electrons. These bubbles and lobes, they represent orbitals, okay? Or probability clouds. And again, an orbital is just a region of space where you can have a 90% or higher chance of finding an electron. So these are the orbitals where you can find the electrons in. Now, where the electrons are in the orbitals, we don't know, but that's the best we can do. So instead of representing atoms using Bohr diagrams, the picture on the right is more accurate. The problem is that's not very helpful 
Okay, looking at that doesn't really tell us much, and that's very annoying to draw. So there's got to be a better way. And also, electrons found in these orbitals, they still have the energy levels. Okay, orbits, the orbits around the nucleus, that's not real, but the energy levels are real. Those do exist, and different orbitals contain different energies. So the electrons can still jump from a lower energy level to a higher something called an energy level diagram, the picture on the bottom right. So how do you interpret the energy level diagram? So first of all, there is a letter N, the diagram on the left, it has N equals to one, N equals to two, N equals to three and four, those are the energy levels. And the bigger the number, the higher the energy, the farther it is from the nucleus. Orbital increase or orbital energy increases with energy level. Okay, so if you want to describe a high energy orbital, that, that's probably found in n equals to a big number. Okay, whereas n equals to one, that is the lowest energy orbital. All right, so those dashed lines in the picture on the right represent orbital. One dashed line is one orbital. The numbers, the one, two, and three, that is the energy level. Okay, the S P and the D, that represents the type of orbital, which we will talk about later. So instead of drawing rings around the nucleus, we now draw dashed lines in different levels to represent their energy. And those dashes represent orbitals where you can find electrons. Okay, does that make sense so far? Now we're gonna actually do some examples using these energy level diagrams. But before we get there, we have to understand something called quantum numbers. So quantum numbers are four different numbers that describe where you can find an electron within an atom, okay? An electron can be found in an atom and described using four unique quantum numbers. It's just like the electron's address. You guys all have an address. Okay, you live somewhere on Earth, and we can describe where you are using a seri series of texts and numbers. That's your address. And I'm guessing that you guys don't have the same address, unless you're a family, you live together, but I don't think so. So you probably live in different places, so you have your unique different address. Same with electrons. Okay, every single electron in the same atom, they have their own unique atomic address and those are the four quantum numbers and we're going to study what they are and what they mean. So the first number would be n. Okay, this is the principal quantum number. The second number is l, the azimuthal or secondary quantum number. Some people call it the angular momentum quantum number. The third one is ml uh, with the subscript. That is the magnetic quantum number. And the last one is ms, the spin quantum number. All right, so you need to know these four and we're gonna look at them one at a time starting with the first one. So the first one is the principal quantum number and represented by the letter n. What does that mean? N simply tells you the energy level of that orbital, okay? N can only take on positive integer values. So one, two, three, four, blah, 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 up to seven. Okay, can you have eight? Sure you can. It's just that we don't need eight. Um, we would have ran out of elements when we get to n equals to eight. There is no n equals to eight because there, there aren't that many electrons to warrant that high of an energy level. So we kind of stop at seven. So n is equal to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You can't be a decimal. You can't be a fraction. The bigger the n, the higher the energy level. Okay, so an energy level can also be referred to as a shell. A shell is the atom's main energy level given by the first number n. Okay, the first shell n equals to one, the second shell is n equals to two, and so on and so on. 
Now the second quantum number is a little bit more confusing than N. So L, the secondary quantum number, that describes the shape and the type of the orbital. The value that L can take between is between zero and n minus one. It could be any integer between zero and n minus one. It can be a decimal again. So this is a range, okay? And what does it do? It specifies the subshell. Okay, what is a subshell? The subshell tells you the type of orbital you have. Orbitals come in different shapes and sizes and types. So this tells you the shape and the type. Okay, subshells are defined by the quantum number L. And there are four types of orbitals. There's the S, the P, the D, and the F. Okay, so if you look at that diagram, n equals to 1 is just a flat line. That's it. Nothing special. But once you go to n equals to 2, you actually have two lines, not one. This is representing the fact that there are two types of orbitals that exist in that shell. And when you go to the third energy level, the third shell, you have three lines. That represents three different types of orbitals with different energies all in the same shell. And those are the subshells. And that is represented by F. Right. And this table, it summarizes the relationship between the quantum number L and the type of orbital and what they look like. Okay, so let's look at this one row at a time. The top left corner, when L equals to zero, remember L goes from zero to N minus one, so L could be zero. If you have L equals to zero, what type of orbital would you have? You have the S orbital. Okay. By the way, SPDF, they stand for Sharp Principle, Diffuse, and Fundamental. Those are the names of the orbitals. We just abbreviate with the first letter. The S orbital is spherical. Okay, It is a ball. That's what it looks like. That's it. When you have L equals to 1, you would instead have the P orbital. And the P orbital looks like a dumbbell. Okay, Keep in mind the pictures I'm showing on the right. It is one of many possibilities. It doesn't have to look exactly like that. You can have a variation where it is kind of twisted and turned in space. I just happen to choose that one to represent P orbitals. P orbitals all look like dumbbells. You have two lobes, but don't be confused. That is one orbital, not two. Just because it has two lobes doesn't mean it has two orbitals, okay? The shape of the orbital happens to be a lobe, well, two lobes and it looks like a dumbbell. So a maximum of two electrons in the p orbital. When L equals to two, you will have the next highest d orbital. And d orbitals look a lot more complicated. You have four lobes instead of two lobes. Again, it is one single orbital. Just because it has four lobes doesn't mean it's four orbitals. And it doesn't have to look like that in the picture. You can turn it and twist it in different ways. That is just one example of what a d orbital looks like. And when L equals to three, you have the f orbital. I'm not even gonna try to explain what the f orbital looks like. You can just look at the picture and see how messed up that is. It is extremely complicated with many lobes and all kinds of angles and orientation. So f orbitals are the most complex, but it is still one orbital and it can contain a maximum of two electrons. It doesn't matter what the shape is, one orbital, two electrons, okay? So far, does that make sense? L, it can take a value of zero, one, two, three, four, five, blah, 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 depends on what your N is. And those correspond to a specific type of orbital and they all have their unique shapes. Questions? The N here is one, two, three, four. Yeah, in this case, N goes up to four, yes. So that's why it stops at three. Well, N could be higher, that means L can also be higher, and there will be a question later that gives you a question like that, and I don't want to give it away, so let's just wait until then and see what happens. On the yeah. last slide, there was an energy staircase or something. Yep. Like that. Oh, so basically the energy staircase tells you the energy level of these subshells, okay? It's a staircase because it ascends and you go up. So from n equals to one to n equals to two, there is a big jump in energy because you just went to the next level. 
But the next staircase is really tiny because you're still in the second level. It's just that you jump from one type of orbital into the other type, but you're still in n equals to two. And then a steep jump to three and then small jumps because it's the same energy level, just different orbitals. Does that make sense? Why is the jump from one to two so much bigger than from two to three? Well, that's, that's just diminishing return for the energy. Right? It is really difficult to move it away from the nucleus when you're close, but oh, once you're far sure. away, you need less energy to move it. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does. Thank you. All right, so those are good questions. Um, so back to this. N equals to one. What can you have? Well, that means L must be zero, right? Because L is from zero to N minus one, and you know one minus one is zero. So you can only be zero. You have no choice. And if L is zero, you're gonna have an S orbital and you're spherical, that's it. Okay, that's quite simple to understand. Now, if N equals to two, L can take two numbers. It could be one or zero because two minus one is one. So you have two options. And if you have two options, you would have two different types of orbitals. You can either have the S orbital, that is L equal to zero, or you can have the P orbital, L equals to one. So you have now two options. And similarly, if you go to the next level, n equals to 3, L can be 2, 1, or 0. And you would then have three different types of orbitals. It could be S, P, or D. All right, so this is telling you that the first energy level only has S. The second energy level has S and P. And the third level has S, P, and D. And you can imagine what the fourth level is, because I don't have it in the picture, but... If you extrapolate, when n equals to 4, you can have s, p, d, and f. Okay, see how this works? I like to imagine orbitals and these energy diagrams like a hotel building. On the first floor of the hotel, you have one room. On the second floor of the hotel, you have two rooms. The third floor, you got the three different types of rooms. And the rooms, like the s orbital, is the most basic one. It exists in all levels, starting from 1. The P exists starting from level two and above, but not in one. And D orbitals only start at three and it goes up and there's no D orbitals in one or two. Okay, so imagine you check into a hotel, you're on the first floor and you're, you're poor, so you wanna buy the cheapest room, I want the basic. I mean, I just need a bed and a toilet, that's it. Right, that's your S orbital right there, you go into that room. And if you're a little bit well off, okay, you know what? I want a kitchen, so okay, you get, you know, the normal room you, you get the next level up you, you're the p orbit and if you're rich you'll be like you know what i want a fridge okay and i want a tv so you get the deluxe room the d orbital that only exists from third floor and above and if you're swimming and money you, you want the best room you have available just give me everything you got i want a whole nine yard i want a toilet a bed a kitchen tv wi-fi you know jacuzzi, whatever. Then you have the F orbital and that only exists from the fourth level and up. Okay, you see how this works? So I like to imagine hotel buildings and rooms for orbitals. So do we have any questions before we go to ML? Are the little steps, like in between the orbitals, are those the sub shells? Yes, the big jump, that's the difference in the shells, but the little tiny steps, those are the sub shells, exactly. So the, there's an energy jump from the S orbital to the P orbital in the second level. So the P orbital is more energetic than the S orbital. Okay, and in the third level, you have S, P, and D ascending like that. D is the highest, S is the lowest. There's a small energy jump between the different types of orbitals, but you're still in level three. Does that make sense? Yeah. So for the... If you have n equals to three, mm -hmm. does it mean you can you have all three types or you have one of the three types? If you have n equals to three, you have all three types. Okay. You, like, you can't just have one type of orbital in that shell. You must have all three types. Okay. Okay, so let's move on to the third quantum number which is the magnetic quantum number. Now, what does this mean? Now, this gets really confusing. It describes the orientation of the orbital in space. What does that mean? Well, okay, imagine this stylus right here. I'm holding it up like this. 
This is one orientation of the stylus. If I turn it like that, well, that is another orientation of the stylus, but it is the same stylus. It's just, it's a different angle, okay? If I turn it like that, oh, look, here's another orientation of the stylus. So ML, the magnetic quantum number, it tells you basically which direction is that orbital pointing, okay? And the values of ML, it is between negative L and positive L. So it depends on the previous quantum number. And if you look at that three-dimensional graph, um, if you took calculus and vectors, you'd learn 3D graphing. The three different types of p orbitals, they are basically all dumbbells. It's just that they're located in a different axis, okay? You have the px, the orbitals are found along the x-axis. The pz is on the z-axis and the py is on the y-axis. But they're all p orbitals, the different kinds of p orbitals but they're still all p orbitals. And the magnetic quantum number will tell you which one you're looking at, and it will tell you how many of these orbitals do you have. All right, so it, uh, the next page should give you a better understanding. So if you go back to the energy level diagrams again, because these uh, subshells, they have their orbitals and they have these magnetic resonance it is not just one thing per level, okay? In an energy level, you have different subshells. And these subshells can overlap with each other. If you look at the first energy level, the simplest one, you only have one S, that's it, nothing interesting. But in the second level, you have two S and two P. Okay, in the second level, you're allowed to have an S orbital or P orbitals. And there are three P orbitals. There's only one type of S orbital, but you can have three types of P. In the third level, you have S, P, and D. So one and three S orbital, three, three P orbitals, and D orbitals, you can have five of them. You can have five three D orbitals. But look at where the three D orbitals are. It is above the four S. Do you notice that? The next level four S, it kind of split into three because of resonance. Actually, 3D has higher energy than 4S. And 4P has higher energy than 3D. 5S has higher energy than 4P. So they kind of overlap sometimes. It is not clear cut. It doesn't mean all four level four orbitals are higher than level three. No, 3D is actually higher than 4S. You have to know the order of this. And you might be thinking, how would I remember that? Like That seems random. There will be a really good way of remembering. I'll, I'll talk about that in the next class. But right now, I just need you to understand that there are four types of orbital, S, P, D, F. They come in different numbers, okay? Let's try to fill out this table. If you understood what I just said, you should have no difficulty filling out this table. So I'm gonna walk you through the first few rows and then I'll give you time to work on the rest of them. So the first row is already given to you. If n equals to one, L must be zero, okay? Because L is from zero to n minus one. So only one option, zero. And if L is zero, you only have S orbitals. So you're in level one and you're in S orbital. So the sublevel is one S. ML can only take the value of zero because ML exists between negative and positive L. So again, if L is zero, you must be zero. How many orbitals do you have? you count the number of ML values you have. You have one value of ML, just zero, meaning that you have one orbital in the S subshell, only one possibility for S orbital, and that is your circular, your spherical. And because you only have one orbital, you can have a maximum of two electrons. You see how this works here? Let's try this again for the second level. Now, N equals to two now. You have two possibilities. Let's do the zero first, L equals to zero. If L equals to zero, you have an S orbital and you're in the second level, so you're two S. ML can only be zero because L is zero. And how many values of ML do you have? Well, just one. You have a value of zero, so one value, one orbital. So there's only one two S orbital, okay? I'm not gonna count the electrons yet because I'm not finished. Now, if L equals to one though, 
then the sublevel becomes 2p. You're still in level 2, but the type of orbital would be a p orbital, so 2p now. What about ml? You can take the value from negative 1 to positive 1 because l is 1. So you have negative 1, 0, and 1. So how many orbitals is that? You count and go, oh, there's three numbers there. Three. Okay, so there are three p orbitals. You see what I'm saying? Every single p orbitals in every level, there's three of them. So let's count the total number of electrons. You have four orbitals in total. There's two electrons each. So that adds up to eight electrons in the second shell. Do those numbers seem familiar to you? The first shell having a maximum of two. The second shell having a maximum of eight. I'm sure you learned that in grade 10. When we learn about the octets, we teach you how to draw more other for diagrams. Well, the first orbit, you got to have two. That's it. The second orbit, you got to have eight. No. But sir, why? Don't ask. Okay, wait till grade 12 chemistry because I can't explain why without orbitals. So now you know why. Why does the first orbital have two maximum? Well, because you only have one orbital, just the one S. That's it. What about the second one? Why does it have a maximum of eight, not nine? Well, because you have four orbitals there. One of them is the 2s. You have three of them as the 2p. They add up to eight electrons. That's why. Okay. So now you can go into three. In level three, it's just, well, L is zero. You have three s, ML is zero, one orbital. So could you fill out the rest of this table, please? I'll give you around like five minutes-ish. Fill out this table, um, and I will take it out row by row, and we'll count the electrons together. So make sure you do that. Uh, make sure you know how to do this. You gotta know how to convert between N, L, and ML. So I'm gonna start the timer. I'll come back in five. All right, I'm gonna take these up. So we are at three, uh, three P, so right here. So if L is one, then you have 3P because uh, one equals to P when it comes to L. So ML is all the numbers between negative one and positive one, and those are negative one, zero, and one. So that means you have three orbitals in the 3P subshell. The next one we didn't see before, uh, when L equals to two, because when N equals to three, L can be two now. The sublevel will be 3D because when L is two, you have d orbitals. And ml this time will exist between negative 2 and positive 2. All the numbers are between as well. So negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. And if you count how many numbers there are, you will count five numbers. So that means you have five different d orbitals in the 3d subshell. And if you want to count how many electrons can exist in the third level, you add up all the orbitals, you have nine orbitals and two electrons each, you arrive at 18. This is why we say that the third level has a maximum of 18. Now in grade 10, if you remember, that's not what we said. In grade 10, your teacher told you, well, in the third orbit, you can have a maximum of eight. You can't go above that. And we're gonna explain why there is a difference. Um, we're probably gonna learn that in the next lesson. So right now it's 18. In the fourth level, it's the same story. When L is zero, you have four S. ML is zero, you have one orbital of four S. The next row, when it's one, you have four P and you have three of those. When L equals to two, you have four D. Again, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two. There's five ML values of so five orbitals. Lastly, this one we didn't see. When you have L equals to three, that means you have an F orbital. So you have four F. And ML can be negative three all the way to positive three and all the numbers in between. And there are seven of those numbers, meaning that if you add up all those numbers, one plus three plus five plus seven, uh, that would be 16. You multiply that by two because every orbital can contain two electrons. So in the fourth shell, you can have a maximum of 32 electrons. All right, so does this table make sense? All you have to do is apply the formulas that we talked about, the relationship between NL and ML, you will be able to figure out this table. 
and you will have to know which level has which type of orbital and how many of those orbitals exist between the subshells. Okay, if you can't memorize that, well, using this rule, you can deduce how many there are, but it's not very difficult to memorize. So you might be wondering, uh, what about the same subshell, all S's, but across different energy levels? Are they the same or different? They're different, okay? If you look at the picture, you can have one S, two S, or three S. They're all S orbitals, and they all have a spherical shape, but they're not exactly identical. First of all, the higher energy levels will have a bigger sphere. And if you cut them open, you will see that in the higher energy levels, you have nodes. A node is simply an area of zero probability of finding an electron. You will never find an electron in those regions. And the reason is because electrons are waves, waves can interfere with each other. And if you have a wave that goes up and a wave that goes down, that's destructive interference. They will cancel out and you would then have a zero probability of finding an electron there. So bigger orbitals, higher energy levels, you have nodes, whereas one X you don't, it's just a sphere, okay? So there are small differences. The shapes though, they're not different. It's just round. So this is to summarize the different orbitals and how many do we have? So when you have L equals to zero, you will have the S orbital. And when you have L equals to one, you have the yellow P orbitals. L equals to two, you would have those blue D orbitals. And finally, when L equals to three, you have these green F orbitals, okay? And also they come in a specific number. You only have one of the S orbitals. There's only one possibility, one orientation in space. If you're a sphere, you can turn it any way, it'll still be the same sphere. But if you have the P orbitals, you can have three different orientations of this corresponding to the three different axes. Now, the D orbitals are a lot more confusing. There are five of the D orbitals and they all have a different orientation. You can kind of see that um, the first one on the left the lobes are found between the axes horizontally. The second one, DXZ, it is on the X and Z axis. The middle one looks like, uh, you know, a lobe up and down with a hula hoop in the middle. And then you have the DYZ on the Y and the Z axis and the DXY on the X and the Y axis. So there are five different ones. Don't worry, I will never ask you to draw them. All right? it, it is ridiculous to have to draw these. Um, you don't have to know which one is which. I just need you to know that there are five different D orbitals. And if I give you a picture of a D orbital, you, you need to be able to tell me, hey, look, that's a D orbital. Okay, you, you have to recognize it. You don't have to draw that. Finally, the F orbital, there's seven of those. And look at how messed up the drawing is. I'm like, it is so complicated, it is difficult to explain. The only one that I remember is the middle one of the double hula hoop. I don't remember the shape of the other ones because, you know, it's just crazy. So I just need you to know that there's one S orbitals, three P orbitals, five D orbitals, and seven F orbitals. Okay? Does that make sense? So no questions regarding the shapes and how many and orientation of the orbitals. If not, then we'll move on to this part, the orbital designation part. You can't actually draw them okay like it's silly to have to draw these orbitals so we got to find a way to represent them in you know some manner so we write them using symbols for example here 3px the 3 tells you the n value that is a shell the p tells you the subshell the l value the shape of the orbital it's a p orbital and lastly the x that is representative of the ML value, the orientation of space. So this is telling you that this orbital is on the X axis. I wouldn't worry about the X, okay? Just know 3P. The X uh, doesn't matter. I'm not gonna test you what a 3P X looks like. Oh, how does that differ from a 3P Y? I wouldn't worry about that. So make sure that you know the three of the P and what they mean, okay? So that's an orbital. 
If I say 3D, you should know exactly what I'm talking about. D orbitals in the third energy level. So finally, you have spin quantum numbers. This one is actually very simple. MS, spin, it simply means the direction of the magnetic field generated by the spinning electron. So when electrons spin, you generate a magnetic field that's either up or down. If you point up, you have a plus half as your spin number. If you point down, you have a minus half. That's it, there's no other numbers. If you're either up half, plus half, or minus half. All right, so because each orbital can have a maximum of two electrons, when you do have those two electrons, they must have opposite spin. You must have an up and a down. That's it. You can't have two up, you can't have two downs. They must be different in their spins. Otherwise, they can't be in the same orbital. Does that make sense? All right, so the spin, again, it refers to the direction of the magnetic field that it is producing. So that's why we call it up and down. All right, so any questions regarding spin? Awesome. So now that we learned all four quantum numbers, we can now learn the Pauli exclusion principle. This simply says each electron in an atom, they must have their own unique combination of quantum numbers. No two electrons from the same atom would have exactly identical four numbers. You can share the first three numbers, no problem, but then the last number must be different. All right, so if you have the same N, same, uh, same L, and same ML, that simply means you're in the same orbital. Okay, NL and ML describes the orbital. So that means you must have opposite spins. So MS must be different. Otherwise, you can't exist. All right, so since only two values of MS are allowed, you can have two electrons per orbital. So this is the Pauli exclusion principle each electron has their unique address in the atom. All right, so let's actually do some examples with quantum numbers. So here's example one. For principal quantum number n equals five, determine the values of the secondary quantum number L and the types of orbitals in each case. All right, so I'll give you like a minute on this. It doesn't take very long. I'm going to take this up in one minute. All right, so I'm taking up example one. Because n equals to five, and you're asked to find the secondary quantum number L, that simply means L exists between zero and n minus one, which is four. So you can have this. You can have L equal to zero, L equals to one, L equals to two, L equals to three, and L equals to four. Each of these correspond to one type of orbital. So we have 5s, 5p, 5d, 5f. Okay, wait, there's a 5g. What is that? We never talked about a g orbital, did we? Well, theoretically, there are orbitals beyond f. Okay, we just never talk about them because they're empty. We don't have an element with that many electrons that needs a g orbital. You can just fill out the orbitals before it and that's it, that's enough. So g orbitals are always empty unless electrons get excited and they jump there. Okay, but we're not going to consider that scenario. So g orbitals, technically, they exist in theory. It's just because they're empty and orbitals are just conceptual, they're not actually defined. Like you don't actually see an orbital, it's just a calculation. So no, they don't exist. And if you want to imagine um, more orbitals, if L equals to five, what orbital do we have? Well, you just go alphabetical. So you have G orbitals, and then the next one will be the H, the I, I don't know why there's no J, but there's K and L, so alphabetical order. You never have to worry about those because, you know, we're, first of all, I'm never gonna test you that. And second, they don't exist, okay? But theoretically, if somebody were to discover or more realistically create a heavier element, we would start a new row on the periodic table and that element might 
have electrons at the g orbital if it's big enough, okay? All right, so here is a summary of what we've learned. So here is the energy level diagram. You can relate quantum numbers to the energy level diagram. So let's talk about n. If you talk about n, that is the energy level, you go across, you go n equals to one, n equals to two, n equals to three. That's the highest one, okay? The three, two, and the one, they tell you what n is. If you go upwards, you can find the L values, the S's, the three S's stacked in a, row, in a column, that means L equals to zero. The P's in the second column, the 2P and the 3P, that is L equals to one. And finally, the third column, the D's, L equals to two. The individual orbitals, they are the M values, the ML, okay? If you have an M equals to zero, then you must be an S orbital. If you're a P orbital, you can have an M of negative one, zero, or one. And whichever that is, it depends on the orbital that we're talking about. So each of these individual orbitals have their own unique ML values. And finally, the spin number is up or down. Okay, MS, if it's up, we use an up arrow. It's actually a half arrow that points up. That tells you that this electron is pointing upward, the spin is plus half. If you have a negative half spin, that means the arrow points down. So look in the first orbital S1, you see two arrows, one point up, one point down. Okay, those are the two electrons in that orbital. So if I ask you to draw this, you will simply draw arrows instead of little dots for electrons now. So up arrow, down arrow, that represents the spin of the electrons. All right, so do we have any questions regarding quantum numbers and energy diagrams? No. All right, perfect. Example two, let's test your knowledge here. I have here four electrons on this energy diagram. So please describe their four quantum numbers for each of these electrons. All right, I'll give you a couple of minutes to work on this and then I will take this up again. I'm gonna ask um, some people to tell me their answers. So I'm gonna pause. So uh, how, do you, how would you write them as quantum numbers? I'll show you the first one. So for the one on the bottom left in the 1s, well, n equals to one because it's the first level. L must be zero because you are an s orbital. ML also must be zero because, you know, you have no choice. L is zero, ML is zero. And since that electron is pointing down, it must be negative half. See how this works? Okay, somebody tell me that um, electron in the 2P, uh, what the quantum numbers are, anyone? So N is two. Mm -hmm. L is uh, positive one. Okay. Well, L has to be positive, so you don't have to say positive one. Oh, yeah. L is one, ML is positive one. Right. Yeah. MS is positive one half. Yeah, there you go. So two, one, negative one, plus one half. Right. So uh, what about the other two? Come on, folks. That's N equals three. Mm hmm L equals two. Yes. Wait. I'm L not yeah, never mind. L equals to two, yeah. I'm L equals negative two. Mm-hmm. And there's an MS of positive a half and negative a half. Right. So the one on the left, you have three, two, negative uh, two and plus half. The one beside it, they're in the exact same orbital. So the first three numbers are identical. So three, two, negative two. The only difference being that the spin is down, so it's negative half. So I hope you see how this works. Uh, you can map electrons on the energy diagram using the four quantum numbers. Okay, so they're very useful. So the last little bit is to show you a video on atomic, a quantum number and orbitals. Um, keep in mind that the second half of this video is actually for next class, so it's like a preview. Okay, so do we have any questions before we end it for this class? 
No, it's all clear. So basically we learned the quantum model of the atom, how electron is actually a standing wave. And you can't actually find electrons in specific locations, but only a probability of finding them in like certain areas, so that's an orbital. Um, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, you can't know both the position and the momentum of the electron. And also the four quantum numbers, NL, ML, and MS, and how to draw um, energy level diagrams and how to locate electrons using the quantum numbers. So this was a long class. Um, this was um, very new and uh, kind of difficult. If you don't have any questions, I'm going to end it here. Can you